Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about overcoming adversity. I'm grateful to welcome special guest Dorsey Ross. Dorsey is not your everyday storyteller. He was born with Apert syndrome, which is a condition where the bones of the skull fuse together too early while the fetus is developing. This affects the shape of the head and face. Also, fingers and toes may be fused together. When Dorsey was born, the doctors gave his parents no hope for survival, but he did. Teachers told him that he would never make it in college, but he did. Dorsey's life saying is, can't is not in my vocabulary. He believes that with God, all things are possible. And now he's an author, a podcast host, and a man with a message. I will include a link to his website, Dorsey Ross Ministries, in the description. Welcome, Dorsey. It is a privilege to be visiting with you today. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm so excited. I really have been looking forward to this. It is an honor. Um, Dorsey, your life is an example of overcoming life's obstacles, and your book is called Overcomer, which is such an appropriate title. Would you mind sharing your story of living with Apert syndrome? Yeah, well, you mentioned a little bit of it. When I was born, my forehead was pushed out with my eyes and nose were pushed back into my head and my fingers and toes were fused together. I had no individual movement of them. And, you know, the doctors had rushed me off to examine me because at that time in, in 1977, they didn't have the testing and they didn't have all the modern, you know, testing and whatnot that they do today to determine the health of the baby and determine what the outcome of the baby is going to be. So the doctors, you know, rushed me off to examine me and, you know, they came back in later on to talk to my parents and they said, you know, you know, it doesn't look good for your son. He has no skull opening and no room for his brain to grow. And, you know, eventually he'll become brain dead. And we think that the best option for you would be to sign papers over to put him into a institution. And my parents were older in age, and my, my mom was 41, my dad was 45, and they weren't even expecting to have another baby. My mom was kind of shocked even to find out she was pregnant because she thought that she had some type of tumor growing inside of her, and she went to the doctor, and the doctor said, well, you know, Good, good news is that there's no tumor growing inside of you, but you do have a, a baby growing inside of you. And, you know, when the doctors gave them this option to, or to put me into the institution, they said, no, we're, we can't do that. We're not going to give up on the baby that God has given us. And they decided that they would take me home and see what God was going to do with this baby that God had given them. And at one point in the hospital, there was a nurse in the hospital that had, you know, gave them the idea of taking me to another hospital, hospital in New York City called Columbia Presbyterian. And they could, you know, the doctors there doing operations on babies like your son, why don't you take them there and see what, you know, what will happen? So they did, and the doctors there said, well, you know, we can operate on your son. We can, you know, you know open up his skull and allow, you know, relieve some of the pressure that's going to be on his brain. And, you know, he'll have difficulty he'll have trials that he'll have to go through but you know he'll he'll survive and at six weeks of age I had my first 
have permission to open the skull and to allow my brain to grow and allow it to function normally. And from about from six weeks to about five years old, I had about ten operations lasting up to ten hours at a time. Wow, ten and hours. Well, throughout my life, I had about sixty-eight operations to, you know, reconstruct my face and to, you know, separate my fingers and to do all these things to, you know, help me to look better, but also help me to feel better and to, you know, be more healthy and be more strong. Excellent. I'm so glad your parents made the right choice, and I'm glad that there were something that they could do. So the main concern was that your brain, with it being all fully um, fused together, was that there's no room for the brain to grow. That was the biggest right. health yeah. problem issue. Hey, fascinating. That is that is good to know. And that actually, I, I have lots of questions for you, but one of them is a few years ago, my husband and I got a phone call in the middle of the night. I mean, phone calls in the middle of the night are usually not a good thing. And we learned that my grandson, who was nine months old at the time, was uh, had a seizure, and he was life flighted to Primary Children's Hospital. And they, we didn't think he'd make it through the night, but he did. They did some some brain surgery and relieved the fluid. They found that the problem was um, hydrocephalus, and so it was that there was there was too much fluid and the, had no place to drain. And right. so this. Mm-hmm. So this beautiful little child, um, he had a couple brain surgeries and he survived, but he does have brain damage and his body is, is affected then and his body doesn't work very well. And now he's five and he's starting to recognize that he is different and it hurts. And um, he's even, I hate to say this, but he's even had suicidal thoughts. So as you have endured being different. And when I see this beautiful little boy, I see a miracle and I know how amazing it is that he is alive and how I'm so proud of every single thing that he can do. When he learned how to walk when he was three, it was just, oh, amazing. It was amazing. So could you give some advice for someone who is different and overcoming hard things and enduring I mean, I'm sure the bullying is going to come because right. kids do that when somebody's different. Yeah, um, it's tough. You know, I got I got bullied. You know, I got called names like monster and and freak, and you know, I had those. You know, I never attempted it, but I had those thoughts of suicide and just ending my life and. You know, I'm a man of faith, and I believe in God, and I felt, you know, like the the enemy telling me, hey, you're not going to make it in this world. You're not going to be able to accomplish anything. And I think the biggest, you know, thing that people who have disabilities or who have, you know, struggles in their life, they need to realize that you need to overcome those thoughts, you need to overcome those, you know, whether it be people or, or kids or, you know, adults or maybe even, you know, the thoughts in your mind telling you to end your life or telling you that you're not going to make it. You just need to overcome those thoughts and realize that, you know, you made it. And you're living in this life for a reason and a purpose. And that there's a plan out there for your life. Just like I have a plan, you know, and a purpose for my life that God has for me. You know, we all have some type of plan and a purpose for our lives. That's so true. And yet, uh, we feel so ordinary. And like, I don't, there's not really a big plan. I'm not a big, important person. I'm not a, what, what do you feel like your, your plan is, your purpose, your reason for, for being here and for 
enduring the extra trials that you have faced? Yeah, I think it's to encourage people. I think it's to inspire people with my story and with what I've had to go through, what I've had to accomplish in my life. And, you know, traveling around and sharing my story all over the country. And now, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to be on a Zoom call to the Philippines sharing my story about what I've had to, you know, overcome and what God has had, you know, has brought me through. You know, that's what my calling is. I thought I wanted to be a, a youth pastor. I love going, you know, growing up, I love going to the youth group and being, you know, feeling at home with them and feeling encouraged by them because they accepted me and they, you know, loved on me and they cared for me. They they weren't the ones that were, you know, thankfully making fun of me and, and calling me names and, you know, rejected me, you know, was the ones on the outside, you know, walls of that church who was in the, it was in my school that I went to for people with disabilities. And I think, you know, going to that youth group it was part of, you know, God's plan for my life to want to speak to the youth and want to eventually go on to Bible college after I went on to four years of community college. Wonderful. So how was your college experience? It was very interesting at times. Um, Let's, you know, take it back a couple steps because as I, you know, I was never that good in school. You know, in in high school and elementary school, I, I was never that good. I would, you know, not do well on test. I would not do well on you know, math, you know, I can do basic math, I can, you know, put something in algebra, I would not, I wouldn't be able to do it. So, because I went to school for people with disabilities, I had to have a meeting to determine what I was going to do after I graduated. And, you know, talking about, you know, should I do this or should I do that? And things for my parents, you know, growing up, they always allowed me to figure out on my own what I could and could not do. And couldn't wasn't very much. I, you know, I played baseball growing up. I played football growing up. I, you know, people are impressed that I can bowl, you know, do a bowling, you know, throw a bowling ball even with, you know, stubbed fingers. People are even surprised now that, I can drive, you know, that I'm able to drive normally. People would say to me, you drive? Yeah, I drive. You know, they'll ask me, how did you get here? I was like, I I drove. (laughs) (laughs) That's wonderful. So much independence. I love it. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. But going back to the school, um, so at this meeting, my mom was there, my high school history teacher was there, and, you know, other people there, you know, but they asked my high school history teacher, they were like, you know, do you think that Dorothy will be able to make it in college? And he said, no, I don't think that Dorothy will be able to make it in college. I don't think he has the ability to make it in college. And they asked me, and I said, yeah, I think I can make it. You know, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And then they asked my mom, she said, well, if he thinks he can make it, he will. And I I applied for several different colleges, and I decided to go on to Greenville Community College to get my liberal arts degree. And right before I entered, I went on to the college, I had to... My mom was in the kitchen. I was in the living room. I asked my mom, I said, how long do you think it would take me to finish college? And she said, I don't care if it takes you 10 years as long as you finish. 
And the first couple of weeks of my college career in community college was very difficult for me. You know, they had, you know, tests and quizzes the first couple of weeks, and, you know, it was very overwhelming for me because I went from a school of, you know, 100 kids or 200 kids and knowing everybody by name, knowing all the, you know, teachers by name. And I was there my whole, from kindergarten to 12th grade, I was in that same school. Oh, interesting. And then, you know, jumping from that to a uh, college, community college of a couple of thousand students where I didn't know anybody was overwhelming. And then I found out that they had a payoff for Christian club at that school. And it's a Christian club. And I went to that meeting. And from the first time I went to that meeting, Till four years later, when I graduated, I had a peak, I had a comfort, and I felt, you know, like that is where I belonged. I belonged in that school, and I belonged in that, in that club, and I, you know, continued to go on to that club until four years later when I decided that I still felt like God had a calling on my life to become a youth pastor, and I went on to what is now the University of Valley Fort, which is a Bible college. But in August of 2002, I got a call that my mom had recently had a stroke. Oh, dear. And, and at the same time, I had falling and on the campus, and I had broken my arm. Oh, shoot. So I had, because of my, the way my arm got, and I can't lift, you know, my arm straight up um, above my head, I had broken it in a way that they had to operate on it to put pins in my arm. Dang it, one more surgery. My parents, so my parents came down and stayed with me, and my mom, you know, I think he even had the stroke before that, and... You know, four months later on December 7th, 2002, I had a, you know, I was trying to get a hold of my mom on that day and trying to get, you know, and I couldn't get a hold of my mom on that day. And I was trying to get, I was, you know, kind of concerning to me why I couldn't get a hold of her. And I finally got a call from my sister that she had passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry. And I went home, you know, it was the middle of December, you know, a couple of weeks, you know, another week or two, it would have been final week, or might have been even been final week that that week. I went home, you know, went to the funeral and everything, and I even came back that same semester to do my... Uh, to do my finals, to do, you know, finish up that semester. And I knew that my mom wouldn't have wanted me to, to quit. I knew that my mom wouldn't have wanted me to give up. And I went back that same semester, went back that team that January of 2003, went back, you know, August of 2003, went back August of 2004, and on May 5th, 2005, I was able to, you know, cross the stage to receive my bachelor's arts degree in youth ministry. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. And your mother sounds amazing. <laughs> she is. And my dad, my dad is as well. Wonderful. Very supportive. Very encouraging. Even... Even on the other side, she is still encouraging you. And that is right. beautiful. Beautiful. So what are some of your greatest accomplishments that you feel like, your wonderful, happy things that you have been able to do? Oh, it's definitely the, you know, crossing the stage to 
DC is my best resort degree, you know, to, you know, getting not only, not only two degrees, I actually got another one, in another associate's degree while I was in Bible college because they said, you know, I wasn't doing well in Bible college, you know, still struggling with certain classes and certain tests. And they said, look, you know, you may not make it, you know, you may, you know, fail and you may not make it. Why don't you get an associate's degree? So I did. And, and then they said, you know, at least if you don't make it, at least you'll have something to fall back on. So I got, now I got two associate's degrees and one bachelor's degree. And, you know, the other one is doing, you know, what I'm doing is, you know, traveling around you know, sharing my story all over the country. Oh, that's fantastic. And I think the education that you have learned in the school of life has even been better than in the schools with those degrees that you can hang on your wall. That's a beautiful thing. Right. So what are some of your goals in life? Um, I think one of my goals, was, I don't know if it's really a goal, but one of my Hoping what will happen is to hopefully get married at some point, you know, to find a wife and to find that what woman that will will love me no matter what, will love me for who I am on the inside and who I am on the outside as well. That would be lovely. Are you doing dating at all? Are you doing online dating or? I've given up on online dating. I've had too many bad experiences with the online dating. So I've just, you know, given up on that. I'm just hoping to, you know, maybe meet somebody, you know, when I'm traveling or meet somebody, you know, in the hood. Those are great places to go. Just being yourself <laughs> and being in the places right. that you like to be and the things that are important to you. That's wonderful. Well, I hope you find her. That would be wonderful. That would be terrific. So now you've written a book. What made you decide to write a book? I've had, you know, a lot of people over the years tell me, you know, especially when they hear my story, they're like, hey, you didn't write your story? I was like, and in the beginning, I was like, no, I'm not really, you know, I haven't really thought about it yet. And probably about 2014, I started to, to sit down and, you know, write out some thoughts and write out, you know, my story and everything. And it took me about three years to get the, you know, first copy of it done. And the, the first copy of it came out in 2016. And it did pretty good. You know, I have it on Amazon and I had it on my website. And then in 2020, I decided to, you know, we like it a little bit and to edit it a little bit better than it was. So another one came out in, I think it was March of 2020. Excellent. The new one came out. Still, you know, still the same, same name, and, but it's a different cover, you know, new updated cover on it. Awesome. Well, that's a great thing to be doing. So while other people were hunkering down with the coronavirus, you were getting to work. <laughs> Well done. Thank you. Well done. Is there anything else that you wanted to cover? Make sure that well, I ask. Well, if people want to you know, buy the book, you know, they can buy it on my website, which is com. Perfect. And if you buy it directly from the website and not from Amazon, I will, you know, autograph it for you and I'll mail it out. Oh, that's special. Thank you. What a kind offer. Wow. Okay. I'm delighted. Well, thank you so much for joining with me today, Dorsey. In closing, I would like to share a quote by the French playwright Moliere. He said, the greater the obstacle, the more glory in overcoming it. Today, I invite you to take action to overcome your obstacles. See you next time on Linda's Corner.